Hey guys, it's MJ, and in this video, I want to speak about credit models. What I'm going to be doing is I am going to be splitting this video into two. So this one is going to be dealing with qualitative models, and I'm going to be releasing at exactly the same time, but as a separate video, quantitative models. That's just so that the videos aren't too long. Uh, remember, go check go check out the, the previous video I made on credit risk. Uh, it is 18 minutes long, but it will give you a nice foundation. I'm just going to be following straight on from that and jumping into uh, qualitative models. So if you're not following, check out that video and you'll be all good. So qualitative models for credit risk. Qualitative model is what they used to do back in the day. It's, it's the earliest or it was the very first model that people used. And it simply started out as trying to achieve more information about the person before lending their money. Because remember, credit risk is, I'm going to give you a hundred rand today, and I'm going to hope that you're going to pay me back, say, a hundred and five rand tomorrow. Now, the reason I'm getting five rand extra is because of the time value of money, the fact that, you know, I'm being nice, I'm letting you use my money, and to compensate me for the risk that you might not repay me, which means my payoff tomorrow is either going to be 105 rand with probability we don't know, or it could be anything less than 105 rand with a probability of one minus whatever that is. So we need that additional interest rate to compensate us for the risk. Now, we want to try to find out what this probability is. And in the previous video, I said it's impossible to get it, to pinpoint the probability, like to say, oh, he's got a 23.2% chance of default. I don't think that is possible to achieve. But we could get a rough estimate or a pseudo probability that helps us estimate what the probability could be. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to be asking a bunch of questions or we want to get to know the person or introduce certain factors to make sure that our credit risk is what we think it is and that we're not blindsided by some unknown variables. So what does a qualitative risk model look at? First thing it's going to look at, it's going to look at something known as seniority. Okay, when it comes to debt, debt has got different levels of seniority. So what happens is if a business has to, say, get liquidated, the first person that gets paid is the employees, you know, the employee salaries. Then it's the landlord. Then it's the government for uh, taxes and all that type of thing. And then only third, it could be the loan that you made to the company. So it's important to know where your debt ranks. And this is quite, I mean, you could have senior debt, which gets paid back first, uh, junior debt, and then you even get something called unsecured, which gets kind of like paid right at the end. Unsecured also means that there is no collateral. So if you get uh, liquidated, there's the various people who get paid out first, and what they'll be using from that is something known as collateral, or when they liquidate your assets and they turn it all into cash. If you've, say, got, like, say, 100,000 Rand worth of assets, they might only liquidate it at 50,000 Rand. Um, there is a cost in liquidating, in trying to, you know, quickly sell the assets. They do have a reduced price, and they do recover less than the actual uh, value, uh, because a lot of the time it is specialized machines or a house, which, like I said, is e not e-marketable, but has less marketability than some other financial instruments. Something similar to, to collateral is known as a parental uh, guarantee. This is what we see sometimes with um, businesses that are owned by the government or it's a subsidiary of the government. If they ever you know, fail to repay something, uh, it is believed that the government might step in and make sure of their debt. Think of it as you giving 10 Rand to your friend and your friend says, no, charge me a low interest rate because if I can't pay you, 
my daddy will step in and cover the cost. So that's where I think of parent, parental guarantee. If there's one in place, you then have to look at the credit worthiness of the parent uh, or the government, although they normally have a much higher credit rating. Um, another thing to look at when lending money to someone is the nature. Okay, what are they going to be using this money for? What type of business are they investing in? You know, is it some sort of fancy tech startup where they're going to make a virtual reality game where you try to catch monsters or something like that that has got a high probability of failure um, and a very small probability of success? Or are they going to be going and using it in a more a sustainable industry such as you know a utility or making a chocolate factory or beer or, or something like that so what uh, what are they going to be using the money for and why we're saying it's qualitative is because it's very difficult to say what is the different risk of say a tech startup in a new industry that you have no prior data on or an old established one that is still vulnerable to say economic changes that you know a new technology might replace it. So it is very difficult uh, to judge this. And that's why people have developed these quantitative models, which we're going to look at in the next video. Um, but let's, am I running out of space? Let's find some more space for some more of the factors used. Um, another one is economic indicators. The idea being, um, let's say, inflation rates. You know, what is the the current inflation uh, climate? If inflation is quite high, people will probably charge a higher interest rate because a lot of the interest that they earn will be wiped out through inflation, and people chase a real return. Um, I mean, there's I don't know how true this is. I don't know if it's just an urban legend, but uh, with Zimbabwe, with their hyperinflation. They had a massive loan to the IMF, saying like a trillion Zimbabwean dollars. And Robert Mugabe uh, <laughs> went to them with a single note and or with, went with like a five trillion Zimbabwean dollar note and said, here guys, keep the change or something uh, because of the country's super high hyperinflation. Uh, so IMF had made a loan before hyperinflation had occurred. So one trillion Zimbabwean dollars was say equal to say maybe 100 million US dollars after the hyperinflation it was worth like less than 50 US dollar cents um, so inflation does create a little bit of uh, <laughs> interesting things around lending specifically long-term lending and that's why you'll see sometimes that they have people don't get charged a fixed rate but rather a variable rate that can fluctuate um, and inflation is then considered. Also, if inflation rates tend to go up, it might cause people to default more, it might cause people to de default left. Um, economics is one of those subjects where you can't look at something in isolation, you have to see how it's um, you know, intertwined or interdependent with all the other economic indicators. But when making a loan, you will look at economic uh, criteria. I mean, in credit crunch time, what, what was called the credit crunch is because it was a recession, the economic indicators were like, oh, it's too risky to lend money. So nobody lent any money to anybody. And that kind of halted uh, productivity, which prolonged the recession. So, but people didn't want to take on too many risks. And yeah, the economic indicator said now is not the right time to lend. Um, another thing that you can look at is, say, financial uh, ratios. Remember, we looked at, say, fundamental analysis. Uh, maybe get like an accountant on board, say, okay, look, at this is their liquidity to uh, profit margin or this one to that one or price to earnings. You know, accountants love their little ratios and try and see what those ratios mean and interpret them. And that's the whole thing is it does come down a lot to interpretation, which is more of an art than a science to determine if, that's, if the company is in a healthy state or if it's in a not so healthy state. And depending on the industry, the financial ratios might mean different things. So financial ratios, that's why it's falling under quantitative and not, uh, sorry, it's falling under qualitative and not quantitative, like we're gonna be looking later on. And then finally, um, 
with with uh, the qualitative model is you're going to have face-to-face meetings. So face-to-face and just kind of get like a, I know I'm writing this down, a gut feeling, um, a gut feeling about the person. Say, you know, I like this guy's shoes or he's dressed very well. Maybe that means he's a good businessman. You know, these weird, uh, very, very subjective things. That's maybe one of the biggest criticisms of credit models is or quality of credit models is they can be excessively subjective. Uh, I mean, maybe a pretty girl walks in and the guy's doing a qualitative uh, model and he thinks, okay, well, maybe I'm going to just lend it to her because that'll increase my chances of her saying yes to a date later on. I'm being silly, but that's that's where these face-to-face meetings could go. Uh, so these are some of the weaknesses. It's It's very subjective. Uh, they lack consistency because one person might think, oh, this financial ratio means it's, it's bad. Another person might say, no, but this other ratio means that it's good. You know, like I said, interpretation is a little bit of an art of financial ratios. Um, they might have some meaningless indicators. So maybe the, in the face-to-face meeting, they look at, you know, what type of car the person drives. Maybe that's meaningless. Um you know, there, there does allow these rooms for these uh, meaningless factors to, to pop in. Maybe the nature isn't as significant today as it was in the past. And um, that, that's another thing is that these, these things can change in time, specifically economic indicators um, and the nature of their business. Business might pivot or something like that. And loans can be for a long-term nature. And I mean, the one thing that the notes have also written down is that people tend to get anchored uh, with their credit uh, models, uh, especially with uh, qualitative. So let's say your company comes in and they give you a double A rating or they say we're going to charge you 10% interest. You come in five years later and you're like, okay, how much will it be now? And they'll be like, no, we're just going to use our the old one. And you're like, but my business has improved now or something like that. There sometimes is this anchoring this unwillingness uh, to change. Although that's, I don't know, they've listed that as a disadvantage, but that's very much a subjective disadvantage, which is ironic seeing that one of the other disadvantages was that the model is subjective. Um, But yeah, I mean, overall, you're you're asking all these questions and you want to try and figure out how credit worthy uh, is the person who's going to be taking your money. You know, how credit worthy are they? And... The more information you have, the better. But remember, like I said in the previous video, information um, costs money, time, and, you know, it can upset your customers. So you don't want to ask too many questions, but you do want to, uh, you know, optimize that trade-off so that you can have a correct analysis. But there we go. That is qualitative credit models. Um, Feel free to go watch now the quantitative credit models where it's more like, oh, we're going to look at financial data and we're going to be using, you know, option pricing derivatives and this formula and that one. Um, It gets a little bit more mathematical uh, than this one here. But there we go. Go check out that other video. Um, It should pop up on your recommended videos if if Google's doing its, its job right. Thanks guys so much for watching and hit subscribe because there will be more videos tomorrow. Cheers.